Hello and welcome everyone to this important session on innovative governance and development models. In a world where challenges are growing more intricate, it's essential to spotlight successful initiatives that not only address local needs, but also offer lessons for the global community. Today, we will explore contemporary initiatives spearheaded by FEDEN members, each demonstrating remarkable impact in their regions. This is only a small showcase of the amazing work that our members are doing every day. These standout models showcase creative solutions to pressing issues. Today, we'll be venturing to Poland to reflect on last year's decisive election, exploring virtual accountability platforms in Sri Lanka, discussing digital entrepreneurship in Latin America, and finally, taking a closer look at Nigeria's efforts to combat maritime corruption. As we engage in this discussion, I encourage you to consider how these examples can inspire similar efforts in your own communities. Finally, some quick housekeeping. As we're gonna be moving through sessions quickly, we unfortunately don't have time for audience Q&A. However, all of our speakers have profiles that you can send them a message through the Zoom platform under the people tab, or you can email us at fedensecretariat at sipe.org at any time. Thank you for being here. And without further ado, let's dive into our session. First, I would like to welcome on stage Mieczysław Boktatala. Mieczysław is the CEO of the Institute of Private Enterprise and Democracy, the think tank of the Polish Chamber of Commerce. Throughout his career, he has focused on corporate social responsibility, especially among SMEs, programs for business associations and NGOs across the region. Marek Tatala is the CEO of the Economic Freedom Foundation and a manager in the sector of tanks, working in the fields of public policy, communication, regulation, and law and economics. Welcome both, and thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Can you share a little bit about why last year's parliamentary elections in Poland were so consequential and what efforts you both took around that election? Well, uh, it was very important uh, because uh, the third government of uh, populist party peace would be a catastrophe for Poland. It was, I think, the last moment for to stop uh, the populistic changes which were going on and last moment to stop uh, the taking over over the judiciary system, taking over of the uh, independent media. And uh, that was also very important because uh, obviously Polish uh, political life was heading towards uh, uh, clientelism. After last election in, uh, 90, in 2019, it was very interesting report prepared by one of the leftist organization, which was Krytyka uh, Polityczna. And uh, it was about uh, uh, cynism of Polish uh, uh, voters, of Polish, uh, of Poles at all. And it was clear that uh, uh, Polish uh, democracy is heading towards uh, clientelism. That means that uh, people were electing politicians but they were expecting from the other side that the politicians will provide them some of the goods which they have access due to obtaining the important political position at the parliament or at the government. That means that a very common expectation was, okay, you can steal, you can steal public money, but you should share at least something from this with, that with us. And this kind of clientelism was totally killing Polish political, political life. What we were observing was that uh, it was the time when young people, especially young people from the cities which have a stable life and which could be potential voters for uh, democratic forces, were not participating at the election. So one of the most important thing in this election was to bring young people, especially these young people who do not participate in previous election, to the uh, voting pool. 
And that was the project which we were doing together with SIP. That means educating the people about importance of this election, educating them that their participation at the election can change the situation, and that their participation can stop populism and stop this kind of clientelism. And instead of thinking about uh, the way what I get, I can go to the voting pool, but instead I get something from the ruling party. Uh, we should, by education, we should change this kind of view to uh, thinking about uh, political uh, future, about uh, expectation from the political party about and about political program, what we want to build due to the political party and the, to the government. And that with participation and uh, with participation, especially in political life, in participation and the election, we can change the present populist situation. And uh, of course, I'm not stay saying that uh, due to our project, uh, the changing happened, but due to many different kinds of projects like that, uh, what we have been doing uh, with you, the situation has changed and Poland was one of the very few countries where populist was stopped. And I think that was, that was very important uh, uh, during this uh, pre-election campaign, but it's still very important and still very so long of thing uh, we should do. Thank you. Okay, yeah. if I can add something to the to the issue was that it was not a fair competition in democratic elections. Uh, the ruling party had a lot of resources. They were using public media. Uh, in their own favor, they were using state-owned companies, and they tried to use referendum to combine referendum with uh, elections to attract uh, additional attentions to certain issues like uh, privatization. They were, of course, against privatization or uh, re increasing their retirement age. They, they were trying to scare people that the new politicians will increase their retirement age. And by the way, we have the lowest retirement age for women in the European Union. So. We have issue with too low retirement age, plus some other issues related to migration. So they were trying to build additional attention around these topics to attract people to vote for them and also use some resources to promote the referendum, claiming that this is not the part of the uh, campaign budget. Uh, what we were trying to do is to discourage people from participating in referendum. In general, uh, you were entering the election place and you could take two papers, elections and referendum, but people could deny take participating in referendum if there is a turnout, with turnout below 50%, uh, referendums in Poland are not, not valid. Uh, so we had a special campaign. It was inspired by the fact that we could do a free campaign in public media as an NGO. So we use this uh, free airtime in, in public media, but when we created the, the idea, we decided let's do something much bigger. So we fundraised among uh, Polish entrepreneurs. Uh, the key founder was uh, Polish Roundtable of Business, uh, association of mostly big Polish businesses in Poland. Uh, they supported many pro turnout campaign targeted at youth people, at women, but they also supported our anti-referendum campaign. And we professionalized our message thanks to the these resources. We had professional video and we also had different targeting for different groups. So, for example, in public media that were viewed mostly by the voters of the ruling party, the populist party, we were saying you have a free cho choice. You can take referendum card or not. It's freedom of choice, basically, for private media that were watched by viewers, which were also more critical towards the ruling party, were saying this message about the freedom of choice regarding the referendum cards, but we're also saying much more, it is important to vote, go for the elections, don't take part in the referendum, because we are afraid that if we say don't vote in the referendum, people may be confused and don't go uh, to the voting stations at all. So this was important also to have this targeting. We had to uh, uh, around 10 million views of our videos and, and campaign in the internet. We had around 9 million views of our spots in private media and some more views in, in public media. And uh, we copied this example during also the, the European Parliament elections with doing the videos. But what I think is important is that 
uh, this was also the tool for business to be active because business is, you know, hesitant to support clear political messages, but participation in encouraging voting is not, you know, supporting any specific parties. But then NGOs can somehow target the message to also, you know, make it more uh, connected to certain issues like uh, women rights, like uh, like you issues important for the young people, or uh, in case, for example, of the, the our next project, so European Parliament elections, for being pro EU and showing the economic benefits of the pre EU. So so this type of activities for NGOs are also useful for business to show that they are active in democratic community. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marek, you mentioned educating voters not only just to get to the polls, but also to be discerning about voting in the referendum versus the parliamentary elections. I know in the U.S. we have a lot of get out the vote measures, kind of as you mentioned, just encouraging people to vote general. Um, what would you say the nuances were of encouraging voters to be a little bit more discerning? Was that more challenging? Uh I think, uh, you know, it uh, depends mostly on the resources. If you have some resources, and we fortunately had some from this uh, Polish roundtable of business, uh, you can first create professional like content and video. And I think this was the key uh, around this video, which was done by professional actors uh, in a professional setting. Uh, we could, you know, target the message. And also what is also important to have professional research. We spent substantial part of our budget just to have professional first uh, focus groups and then uh, opinion poll to target our message. So we encourage to vote, but we also through this campaign show that there are some certain values in liberal democracy that should be considered when you go to vote, like uh, uh, rule of law or like in the case of the second campaign, being in the European Union, which is beneficial for Poland and Polish economy. So I think having good research is very important and then professional content and what we experienced as we did two campaigns, adding some humor to video, uh, generates some extra views without, you know, investing so much money. It's just, you know, people share this content uh, more easily. If you have more serious message, even if the, con the you know, the, the issues are very serious, I think it's important to think how to use humor even in the very serious situation, because it just generates extra attention in, in social media, in traditional media. If you are too serious in the video, then you have to spend more on advertising to uh, to make uh, the content more visible. Uh, Mieczysław, I know you in your previous project did a lot of targeting for youth and are now working on another campaign actually targeting youth. Did you find um, similar experiences or was there anything that you did differently to make sure that you were reaching that specific audience? Well, we have, uh, uh, we targeted, uh, as I have mentioned previously, we targeted uh, on the young uh, population and uh, we have very positive feedback. So uh, I agree that the most important thing is uh, good content. And uh, we elaborated a series of articles and uh, we send them to different uh, young organizations, mostly student organizations, all over Poland. And uh, very well focused on uh, the rule of law. That means we do not uh, directly ask them, go to pools and vote, but we provide them uh, reasons that they should go to the pool and vote, especially focusing on the rule of law. So we show uh, what is the rule of law, but we show also what are the impact of the lack of rule of law for their for their life, for their everyday functioning on for on their career, how they may what they may expect on the future, and what they can what kind of influence they have on the political life uh, in Poland. And uh, the, most of this organization said, uh, say thank you. We use this article, we, we distribute them also to, to our members. And uh, we receive only very few uh, negative impact. That means uh, I think only once uh, we noticed that one of the organization sent us the comment that, oh, this is just the propaganda. 
uh, you shouldn't do that. Uh, we don't like uh, this kind of uh, uh, statesman. But uh, that was uh, that was exception. But generally, uh, they uh, they confirm that uh, it's very interesting, and they help them uh, to understand what is the importance of rule of law. And now uh, we are focusing on political corruption, which is, uh, I think, continuation of, of our previous work, and uh, which is focused on this, what I have stated uh, at the beginning, that means uh, uh, trying to combat uh, growing clientelism in Poland and showing the negative impact of the clientelism on uh, political life in Poland. And uh, we are preparing also the series of uh, uh, articles, but also a series of uh, web webinar on uh, uh, TikTok, just uh, to show young people what are the impact of uh, uh, political corruption on their everyday life. And that's uh, that's something which uh, I think is very well perceived in these groups, and uh, we expect also at least similar impact like uh, the previous project. Thank you. Um, so what is what do you see as coming up next for Poland? Has the election had any immediate outcomes and what are your next moves? From well, my perspective, the, the topic of the European Union seems very important for, for the future of Poland. We are part of the European Union. Uh, we benefit as, as a country from uh, being there. And what is the problem is that not so many people are aware of economic benefits. A lot of them are aware, and it was based also on our research in during the European Parliament elections, that most of the people think that the, the key benefit of Poland being in the EU, economic benefit, are European Union funds. So the funds that are spent on public infrastructure or, or some uh, public uh, institutions in, in Polish cities or, or countryside. But the biggest benefit is being part of the single market, of being part of the big free trade zone in the European Union. This is at least five times more important. And the problem is that in the future, when we grow, we will be net payer to the European Union. So we will not receive as many funds from the EU as we will pay into the EU budget. And then people may ask why we are there, like if we are now paying more than we are receiving. And we want to think about our project related to European Union as a long-term project. We have the website called polandintheunion.pl in English translation, just to build the, the content, just to build, build the good sources of the content about economic benefits and show to, to, to people that we are earning a lot of money because of being in the EU and being pro-EU is in general, you know, also good for supporting quality of institutions in Poland, rule of law, liberal democracy. Uh, so we want to associate economic benefits with uh, improvement of uh, democratic institutions through uh, being member of the EU, while also you know, showing that there are some problems in the EU that should be addressed. There were recent reports about EU competitiveness, the barriers at the single market. We think that this is important for the EU institutions and to Poland to be an active player in this discussion about the future of the EU economy. Thank you. Uh, Mieczysław? Well, uh, we, will, uh, we are continuing with this project about political corruption, but we are focusing also on corporate social responsibility, which is uh, one of the main activities uh, in uh, our organization. And uh, we have uh, the other project uh, mostly founded by EU, dealing with implementing uh, corporate social responsibility in uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies. So we are uh, uh, verifying organizations, uh, business organization, and later on we preparing them uh, to uh, implementation of uh, approach, uh, corporate social responsibility approach uh, to business which is quite often lacking in small and medium-sized companies. We are doing it in one of the regions of Poland in the beginning, in the Podkarpacki region. And we observe also growing interest among small and medium-sized companies on corporate social responsibility. But also we will focus on the next election because next election looks to be 
as much important as uh, the last one. I mean, presidential election, which we will have uh, in May next year, and uh, which allow our uh, democratic forces, or democratic parties, to continue the uh, reform process and uh, to return on a democratic path. Without, uh, I think, uh, winning this election with the candidate which will uh, be from uh, democratic forces, it will be very difficult to, to return to full democracy in Poland, which will have before this uh, populist party uh, has started. So the next important element for uh, uh, coming back from the path of populism will be the next election, uh, presidential election in May. Thank you. And um, for our final question, the question of the hour, what lessons have you learned that can be applied in different regions? Do you have any advice for those undertaking similar projects? Well, the, I think uh, one of the advice is uh, education and showing, uh, showing uh, the quality of political debate and showing the importance of, uh, uh, let's say, main pillar, main pillar of democracy on everyday life, of uh, especially on a young generation, and to convince them to participate in a political life, which will facilitate uh, the process of changes. And what I think is important as we did fundraise a lot on these projects that we did among business community. It is important to speak with the business community about this in the language they understand. So first have some data, numbers, research, and then uh, when you complete the project, uh, also to uh, to have a good measurement of your uh, of your uh, engagement of your audience and so on, because then they they understand this language of marketing of communication they have in companies, uh, and then and also uh, think how to. Uh, tra uh, how to translate, uh, you know, how to, as an NGO, how to uh, smuggle somehow your message about liberal democracy or rule of law uh, without uh, uh, being uh, uh, accused of creating very, you know, politicized content because business tries to avoid something that is too politicized, but you can still do it in another way. And I think, as I said before, humor is sometimes uh, 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 very uh, good to hear. We, as an our inspiration for the second video in the European Parliament elections, we did the video uh, that some people may know what the what the, what have the Romans ever done for us. This is a Monty Python video, and we did a Monty Python version of Paul speaking about uh, what do we get from the European Union, discussing uh, different benefits. It is available on YouTube with English subtitles. So at our profile of the foundation, you can watch this video and 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 understand it because of the subtitles. Great. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to share with us today. You can learn more about Mieczysław's previous project, The Rule of Law, Our Future, on the Democracy That Delivers podcast, which is fortuitously being republished today. And uh, both Marek and Mieczysław are actually grantees for the next coming round of Fed and Small Grants. So stay tuned for updates on fedin.sype.org or on X at Fed and Global as they both get started. Um, thank you both. Next to the stage, I would like to welcome Dr. Nishan Demel, the Executive Research of Verite Research, um, the Executive Director of Verite Research. He is an economist with extensive academic, policy, and private sector experience and sits on multiple private sector boards and consults regularly as a strategist for some of the region's largest firms. Welcome, Nishan. Thank you, Tamari. Glad to be here. Um, so today we're talking about virtual accountability platforms. Can you explain for our audience what that entails? Yes, Tamari. I think, uh, you know, this concept of democracy animates us a great deal. And yet doing democracy is not as simple as we imagine it, as we read the textbooks and think about the Greeks and how they send somebody to represent themselves in the council. Government has become quite a complex thing. Uh, and I think we all understand that the technology of democracy is not simply about allowing people to go and vote. Uh, 
I think Amartya said said it very well when he said it's not public balloting uh, that simply makes democracy. It's also public reasoning. The ability of citizens and people uh, to understand what the elected leaders are doing and, and the consequences of their decision, right? So ideally, what we are trying to do in this collective act of, acts of public reasoning and public balloting is to, you know, is to have leaders or representatives that make decisions uh, that, are interest, that are in the interest of the public at large and not simply serving vested interests. Uh, that the decisions that actually are sustainable and are good for the long term, not just for short term political cycles. And that the decisions also are not just based on good intentions, but good understanding of feasibility of consequences, you know, otherwise the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So doing democracy is really about getting in a decision making structure that delivers all these things. And I think the motivation for what we are, what you call the virtual platforms or we just call platforms is the idea that, you know, democracy, getting democracy done, uh, it must actually be supported by the ability for society to better understand uh, the, the, what these decisions are and whether they're serving the interest of the public, they're sustainable and they are, analytically feasible and meaningful. Now, historically, I think we expected the media to do that for us, right? Uh, that, that it is the connecting point uh, and, and somehow that there is a way for us to watch the media and understand, uh, you know, and evaluate the decisions that people, people are making for us. But we live in a complex world of media where conventional media is perhaps too sensationalizing or sensationalized and social media is tribalized. And it doesn't really serve the function uh, of helping kind of bring together the interest of a demo democratic interest of society. So we've invented, I think, in, the, in this midst as, you know, contributing to a solution, uh, this idea or concept of platforms that you asked me about. So effectively think of them as a technology that bridges the distance between citizens uh, and the decisions of those who govern. Uh, and, and effectively what we do is through these platforms, we solve at least two kinds of problems. Uh, that is that you know, often people don't have access uh, to adequate the relevant information or understanding uh, or, or the relevant information about what is being done in government. And that's one kind of difficulty. But even when you have access to that kind of information, you don't have adequate understanding of their implications or the meanings of, the, uh, of those decisions. And that also needs to be solved. And that's what our platforms try to do. And of course, I'll unpack some more detail as we go along, right? So the platforms essentially to help to make comprehensible and demystify the work of those who do the governing to those who are governed or citizens in the country, which is really what you expect to be functionally happening in a democracy. Uh, and, you know, we talk about um, three kinds of movements we try to achieve in these platforms. So the first is the movement from opinion to information. That is, otherwise, you can have a large amount of ideas, opinions banted around without being anchored in facts and information. But the second, um, perhaps the most important movement is, you know, you can't have lots of facts and information, but how do you make sense of them? So we say the movement from information to knowledge. And by knowledge, we mean the sense-making activity, what you understand, what it means, what are the implications. And this is so very important because, you know, human beings are interested uh, not just in data, but meaning. And the third movement we say is the movement from knowledge to wisdom, by which we mean uh, more Western rather than an Eastern uh, understanding of wisdom, that is wisdom as knowledge in action. Uh, so once there is a citizenry that is informed, 
that understands what is happening and is being done. Uh, this then creates the motivations for those who are governing as we expect in any democracy uh, to act in ways that actually respond to the understanding uh, of people. Uh, so effectively, essentially, the platforms are a form of technology to make democracy work better uh, or, 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 or more as intended. So let me stop there. I, I know that's a conceptual explanation I've given you, uh, but I hope you it helps to kind of motivate why we do this particular form of engagement, uh, which has worked really well in Sri Lanka. Right, absolutely. Um, so I believe you currently have five different virtual platforms spanning from air quality data to public finance. How did you choose these topics and why are these important to citizens? So I will perhaps share with you kind of just a picture of some of the platforms we have to give you a sense of what there and maybe I'll pick three. Uh, I'll share my screen and maybe talk you through uh, the platforms briefly, okay? And I promise you, promise not to give you a long, I'll, I'll keep my answers short as I go along uh, so that uh, we won't run over time, okay? Uh, so what this shows you uh, is, the, is, is a platform we have to actually watch parliament okay and and uh, members of parliament go to parliament but what happens in parliament what people do in parliament and what they say in parliament you know this is rather opaque and difficult for people to understand now you can have c-span like you do in the us and have live views of parliament it's extremely boring nobody wants to watch it uh, c-span is a euphemism for you know going to sleep in front of your tv um, and also, it, it, just because you watch parliament doesn't mean you understand it. So what we do in this platform is we build an analytical understanding by coding every single thing that happens in parliament. All the things that are spoken, said, we break it down into topics, contribution, content. Uh, and basically, you know, MPs are also ranked and evaluated against each other. So people know what is my representative doing? How is he acting? And because they are evaluated that way, they become motivated to do better. Uh, to be recognized as contributing more because now we are actually taking constructive stuff and ranking them, right? Uh, so rather than simply perform for the camera, as you've seen even in the US, these congressional hearings, there's a sense that mem members of Congress are simply performing for cameras. Uh, what this is a kind of camera that really analytically uh, extracts meaningful, constructive contribution, not just the performative side of what they do when the cameras are present. So, for instance, there are adjournment motions where often members don't attend because the media doesn't come to adjournment motions and there are important subjects that are often discussed late in the evening uh, after parliament has closed because they're urgent and important. Uh, and because we analyze contributions in adjournment motions, MPs, you know, got rather worried and said, you know, why we don't attend because the cameras are not there. And we said, this is precisely the point, right? You've, you've got to be accountable for how you're contributing uh, when the cameras are not present. So, so I think it has really enabled people to understand the contribution of parliamentarians uh, a, a great deal better and, and motivate by that. Uh, parliamentarians also to contribute better. I'll give you another example. Uh, this is um, uh, this is uh, what we call a public finance .lk. It's a, it's a platform to demystify what's happening in the economy and the decisions that are made on the economy. You know, the economy is a very complex thing, right? Uh, it's really hard to understand. So if you want democracy to work, you want leaders to be accountable for the economic decisions you may, they make to people, but who understands economic decisions? Uh, but of course, we need to help people understand economic decisions or democracy doesn't work so well. Uh, Sri Lanka went into a very severe economic crisis when leaders decided to make decisions that were popular in the short term, 
but really not positive or sustainable in the long term. And that's a very easy kind of decision to make in a democracy and be rewarded for that unless somebody calls them out as we did uh, in the public finance platform and actually cut short the duration of those short term policies. Uh, so people need to not only see those decisions, they need to understand the long-term implications, they need to understand the distributive consequences of decisions, they need to understand the feasibility of decisions. So it's complex stuff, but actually we take on that challenge of doing complex analysis of budgets, uh, helping people, but taking the complexity and making it sensible and understandable. Often you are, we tell governments that they must publish citizens' budgets and other things that make, make it understandable to people. But you want this understanding to function in a way that builds accountability. And sometimes government aren't the best at providing information in a way that holds government itself accountable. Right? So you need a third party to do it. And, and because we are specialized uh, in, you know, we have a really great economics team of over 25 people. Uh, we can actually drive a really useful analytical picture of the decisions that are made in the economy. And then these insights that we provide actually change public conversation, public understanding, and in turn, they impact government decision making. So, and that is exactly what you expect in a democracy, right? That public understanding uh, and expect uh, and concerns animate the decisions of of uh, of people who make decisions. So you can see from infrastructure watchers to say, you know, do we have information on what you're doing with infrastructure? Do we have budget com budget promise budget compliance? And that's budget promises. Uh, all sorts of analysis and dashboards uh, that we run on this platform that has really brought people to a much richer understanding of what's happening. The third platform that I will talk about is called Ethics I. Now that's a kind of different platform that's not looking at government directly, but at the media. So of course, media is integral to democracy because when media doesn't work well, as I said, when it's sensationalized, tribalized, then it doesn't perform the function of the fourth estate that we think democracy must perform that, that underlies democracy. And uh, often we find that media today, especially, is polarizing society uh, in ways that actually you know, prevent people from evaluating uh, the leaders or political leaders on the merits of their actions rather than on whose side they're on, right? who they're favoring. Uh, you may remember that Noam Chomsky had this critique of media that said manufacturing, uh, manufacturing consensus. But actually, today we have media, and now that was supposed to be a critique, but you know, we have media today that's manufacturing polarization, uh, manufacturing dissension. And that is extremely detrimental to democracy. I think the problem that Noam Chomsky had with media was the possibility of manufacturing a false consensus or a possibility of manipulating consensus. But if it is, uh, when we talk about a democratic society where diverse interests, opinions, views, ideas, expectations uh, come together in some dialogical form and engage with each other and converge in some way, not diverge, right? You can't get democracy by diverging society. So what we do in this platform is really you know, use accepted standards of media ethics to hold media itself accountable to behaving better in a way that supports democracy. So often racial profiling, religious you know, uh, caricaturizations, uh, various ways in which the media undermine the, the portrayal of the vulnerable, etc., gets captured through lens of universally accepted media ethics and fed back in a way that's created enormous discussion within media circles, within editors, and changed actual media behavior. So, so it's not directly holding democratic leaders to account, but actually this particular platform is solving the technology of improving, keeping a better media in place to keep a de better democracy in place. Uh, and that's what we are doing. So if I summarize, you know, a platform for us is like a stage, right? Uh, people may be functioning, you know, people can function in the dark or without visibility or without attention to what their, you know, understanding of what they're doing. But when you put them on a stage and the lights come on 
and there's an audience, suddenly they behave in a different way to when they would behave otherwise. So whether it's people in parliament or with the economic decision makers or the media, we have kind of, you know, even without the, you know, uh, not, not necessarily asking for their permission, but we have caused them to come on a stage or put them on a stage and suddenly they realize that, that the lights are on them and they can't behave the same way they might not have behaved. And there's a sense of accountability. And we think it's a democratic accountability because the audience is a country. Uh, and this drives better behavior. So the movement, as the audience understands, it, it creates a cycle of feedback, I think, that changes the decisions uh, that are made and the way the actors on stage are performing and moving. And so this is the technology of a platform, right? That it effectively shines a light uh, and builds an audience and builds understanding of that audience in a way that shapes the actors to function in a way that is better for society as a whole. So that's the ambition. Of course, you know, there is all of these things are achieved in part, right? Like there's no perfect solution here, but it's contributing to getting democracy working better in these ways. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, to wrap up with our final question, how implementing these platforms and what advice would you give uh, Tamari, you were breaking up for me, but I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Would so, you like me to repeat so, the question? Or? No, no, I, I think I, I heard the question, but you were breaking up. So I'm going to be very short here and maybe we can take a couple more questions. Uh, I'll give you kind of three quick vignettes of impact, right? Uh, there was, a, and, and kind of, I'll make them soft and easy ones. There was a time when the government said we can, you know, electricity prices had been quadrupled in the country uh, for various reasons, subsidies were removed. And then the government said, we can reduce electricity prices now by 3%. But we did an analysis that showed actually that there was a lot of corruption, a lot of other problems that were bloating up the prices and you could reduce prices through global comparison and cost comparison by 20%. By over, um, you know, we said you could, you know, and and when we published that, it got so much attention in mainstream media, papers, everywhere, that the government came back and reduced prices by twenty percent, right? Uh, and that happened within a space of three weeks. Uh, it's such a big conversation. In parliament, you know, I've had parliamentarians come on stage, go on campaign platforms, and talk about how well they're ranked in parliament and said, I'm so grateful for this platform. Because until now, people in the election rewarded me for what I did in their locality. Did I build a drain? Did I help a school? But I have been elected to govern the country, to pass laws. And because of this platform for the first time, I'm being rewarded for being a legislator, for being a member of, for functioning as a member of parliament as I'm supposed to do. Otherwise my motivations would have been not to do those things, uh, but because I continue to do them, I felt very bad that you know nobody appreciates me, but this does, right? So it, it's a sign and a lot of feedback comes that way to us as well. Even the ethics I platform I talked about, um, you know, it, it it during COVID nineteen, Sri Lanka was really race baiting. It was saying the COVID was spread by a particular community, a particular ethnic group, uh, and we were able to expose the media's, you know, kind of and the politicians using that kind of language and racial profiling as false uh, through the ethics I platform and create a public conversation till ultimately government departments themselves had to issue orders to media saying you have to stop doing that, right? So we find huge national level impact uh, that are generated through, you know, relatively small platforms simply because of the quality of the kind of engagement that they're doing. Thank you so much. Um... Thank you for that very informative presentation and for taking the time. Unfortunately, we are out of time for this session. I know this is so interesting that we could talk about it for hours. So I um, want to make a one minute um, last comment, okay? Uh, because I can see I have probably a minute. 
because I want to give advice to anyone trying to do this. And that is simply this, right? That um, if you're building a platform, uh, you have to be in the long game. Uh, it's very tough because funding cycles are short and money will come and money will go, but you have to be committed to staying at it for a long period of time because platforms become known, become ac accepted, become respected over a time. And it and SIP has been a great partner uh, in helping us build a platform in finance and economics over the long time. Second, I think, is to all to never be partisan. Uh, to be as, as objective as you can when you get into a witness box in a court, you're told you will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you have to believe that the truth is enough, right? That it is more powerful uh, than, than anything else. And if you're tempted to tilt the truth in the favor of what you favor, don't do it. Uh, be as, you know, it's hard to be, you know, nobody's perfectly objective, but be as perfectly objective as you can, because trust is the one thing that you can never lose uh, to succeed. Uh, and think about the three movements, right, for success, move people from in opinion to information, information to knowledge and knowledge to wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for taking the time. I really appreciate you. Um sharing all of this with us today. You can learn more about these initiatives at veritateresearch.org slash platforms, um, and we'll put the link in the chat shortly. Now is my pleasure to bring to the stage Louisa Tomar, the director of SIPE's newest center of excellence, the Center for Digital Economy and Governance. She'll be introducing our next featured speaker. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Tamari. It is such a pleasure to be at the FedEx conference with all of you. Um, I'm Louisa Tomar, the director of SIPE Center for Digital Economy and Governance. And um, today we're going to be discussing the methodology and insights from a recent study we did of Colombian SMEs. So we know digital transformation is increasingly required for an inclusive democracy and economy. Something that Nishan just mentioned about how for democracy to work, leaders really need to understand the economy and you have to make it sensible and understandable for the public. And that certainly goes for the digital economy, which is rapidly changing and you really have to make sure it's understandable and accessible to entrepreneurs and small businesses. So with that in mind, uh, CDEG, my uh, center, and CIPE's Colombia country office work closely with the Centro Nacional de Consultoria, led by Pablo Limon, who's joined us today, to survey 4,000 companies throughout Colombia, including those in the regions most affected by conflict and women-led and LGBTQ-led businesses. This study was also done in partnership with Impulsa. Also done in part and... Um, sorry, with Impulsa, the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Agency of the Colombian government. Additionally, the results of this survey have also informed the localization process of SIPE's digital skills course called Harnessing the Power of the Digital Economy, which is available online. And we adapted it to the Colombian context with a company called Platzi that's focused on digital education in Latin America. So we're really excited to share that the Colombian version of this digital skills course will soon be available on the Impulso website accessible to all Colombian MSMEs. I'm so delighted that we are joined by Pablo Limon, the president of Centro Nacional de Consultoria, who is here to discuss the design and implementation of the survey and its practical applications. Pablo, it is great to see you again, and thank you for sharing your insights with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Luis. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let's confirm if you're seeing what, I, what I'm I'm. Hundred companies in Colombia. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what kind of companies that, that we surveyed. 
So it's very important that you understand that we, we survey formal companies in Colombia, 51% uh, owned by men, 40% owned by women, and 9% owned by uh, a member of the LGBTIQ community. Uh, these municipalities that have been uh, uh, proposed to be more important are more important uh, in the development of peace. So we did 11% and this, these municipalities are poorer and uh, have lower uh, levels of socioeconomic levels. And 11% um, we, we did there and 89% uh, uh, municipalities. On average, the, the companies that we saw, we had 7.8 municipalities and 77% uh, were micro, 25% were small, and 8% were, were medium. So this is this gives you an idea. And we, so the, the first thing I'd like to talk about is like we did a survey before the pandemic. So what happened in terms of technology with these com with companies? And this is important because it talks about, about change, the changes that happened. So the first change that happened is uh, the percentage of companies that had someone that was tasked with overseeing technological matters. So in 2018, 38% of these companies had uh, a person in charge of technological matters. In May 2024, 52%. So this tells you how how much how technology became more important. And that's that's the first like message that I like to deliver. And the other one is the how companies now are able to have wider markets and how uh being in one place is now less important or less defining of of the size of the market that companies have. So what you what you see here is do you purchase services or products from abroad? It used to be 15%, you moved up to 22%. Do you sell uh, services internationally? It used to be uh, three, four, four percent. Now it moved up to 9%. And do you sell services in, or products in locations other than your primary locations? It used to be 29%, it moved up to 46%. So in these small companies, there's a, still a lot to do, but you can see an improvement over time on how companies and being able to, to have wider mar markets, which is obviously very important in the developing of these small companies in, in Latin America. So that's that first thing. And obviously this is, this, is, this is possible thanks to technology. So the next challenge that we have is to measure the digital transformation in this. You know? So how do you measure uh, the digital transformation that the companies are, are having or how companies transforming? So, we, the way we measure this is we measure it through three, three variables. The first variable is technologies. So we ask the companies from a list, a long list of 44 distinct technologies, which ones have they acquired? And we, we've learned, and that's the first variable, how many technologies does the companies have? But we've learned that uh, it's not enough to buy technology or to acquire a technology. You need to implement the technology. That's an, the that's an next step. So we also ask if, if at what if it's implemented, if it's fully implemented, are you just planning the implementation, or is it um, uh, or 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 is it just planned, or is it, are you just planning the, the implementation? And the third reason, and which is very important, is that companies acquire technology for an objective. You know, they don't buy technology just to get to have technologies. So we also uh, made, a, made a list of objectives, of 32 objectives. And from these three variables, we use a methodology that tries to measure how, how, how much do you use, how much do you have of each of these. And to understand a little bit about this, this, thing, not this methodology, because you always have the problem if you have three variables, how do you ponder each one of the variables, which one is more important? We, we use uh, a methodology called that data development analysis. And what, what this does is if it's that you could get through, you could get like a very high score or the, the top score through any of these variables. So if you have all 44 technologies, then you could be, a, you could get a hundred percent. 
If you get uh, 32 objectives, you could have 100%. If you have all the implementations, 40 implementations, which is the best, the best company, then you can have. And that's how we measure. And the score goes from zero to one. And it's a measure of how, how close you are to this two to, to one, right? So I'll, I'll show you the little results. So this is uh, the average company was on like 0.25 from this score. And uh, business owned by men were a little bit higher than business owned by women. And LGBTIQ uh, business owned were higher. In terms of PD, PD uh, municipalities and non-PD, they, they were very similar. We did not find a difference there. And obviously the, the biggest variable that uh, to describe digital transformation is the size of the company. So the medium companies were much more transformed or used much more technology than, than smaller or micro businesses. And also obviously the, the companies dedicated to trading have lower levels of digital transformation than companies related to services or in the industry. Uh, the other thing that it's also very important is that companies that have technology that are, have dedicated their technologies to improve the front have lower levels of digital transformation. And we call the front is what's related with the client. The medium uh, is called the administrative part and the back is the production part. So companies that dedicated their technologies towards the production have higher levels of digital transformation than those companies that dedicated technology to the front. Um, and also, so all of this is, is very, 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 very interesting, you know, to measure how transformed companies are and what are the, the variables of transformation. But obviously you, you also want a path. You want to you wanna understand in which way or how do we, how do we move? If I am at this level of digital transformation, how do I move or what should be the next level? So this, 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 this network I want to show you is a little bit confusing, but I'll, I'll try to explain it. So basically what you see here is uh, the technologies that we asked for. So this is 44 technologies. Uh, each node represents a technology and a connection means a relationship of uh, prerequisite. And what, what it means is basically that technologies that are higher up, those companies that have technologies that are higher up with a very high probability have technologies that are lower. So, you know, you know, you know, what this means is that companies start out from the bottom and they start moving up. So what we see here clearly is that the first technology that companies acquire or that how they start is using mobile devices for work. And this is the first step that companies take. And then they move up to the second level, which are uh, technologies that are used, uh, which are simple technologies such as using uh, promote your products on, on internet. Uh, so using social networks, sending emails. So this this kind of promoting your, your products through internet is like, the, that would be the, the second step using emails and also acquiring a, a bank account. And this will be the, this, this, this second level, which is very, still very basic. And those two uh, make up the basic level, right? Once you have that, once companies acquire these, these capabilities, then they can move up to technologies that are, that are more um, sophisticated, right? And then, and then you have at the, the third level uh, on this graph, you have technologies uh, such as the use of big data analytics. So you start like automating decisions and you start using your emails, right? And this is like this, this third level over here. And then you have a higher level, which you start using uh, AI. And you start using uh, online payroll system payments. And, and, uh, and then you go to the highest level, which is related to the use of bots, which is using AI, like inside your company. And also what comes at this highest level is the use of paid infrastructure. So you start having, using the cloud and you start using other, uh, other technologies that must be paid that are more expensive. So in a way we can have, we can have a, a path for each, for, for the companies in general. And we could, uh, 
divider. So we'll, basically what we see is how these, how these companies start moving from basic digitalization to intermediate, which is related to decision-making, data, advanced automation, and AI engagement, right? So this is like a, a here we have a path that was acquired all through data, you know, through the service that we did, we could see how companies grow into this path. And this is also useful because if you want to promote a specific technology, which is like the, the next example, oh, this is, and this is how this is, sees, how we can see this. And obviously this is related to the transformation industry we just saw. Uh, sorry. So obviously it's, it's basically the same pattern, but here we do see a little difference in terms of non-PDT uh, municipalities and PDT municipalities being which uh, municipalities uh, in these poorer re regions of Colombia are less likely to get to these highest levels. But other than that, you can see almost the same pattern, you know, obviously medium companies, which are the largest companies in the, in the, in the sample, uh, have higher, le higher levels of uh, digital transformation and on top. And, and uh, I was mentioning before, this also helps, this, this research also helps us understand if you want to promote a specific technology, what are the prerequisites that you have to take or that the company must have in order to get there. So I'll, I'll, tell, I'll give you some examples. This is the same thing as mentioned before, the front, the middle and the back, companies that have dedicated the technologies to their back are more likely to be, to have larger levels of transformation. And this is this, this, the sample I was, I was thank, talking to you about. So what we observe here is that the government is making a, a big effort to promote electronic invoicing so that all invoices are made electronically. And we can clearly see is that companies that have electronic invoicing, they use emails and they use mobile devices. Those percentages that you see there, 69%, is the percentage of companies that use mobile devices at, at work in these look, micro companies, right? And uh, you can see it, um, this is micro, this is uh, small and medium companies, what the percentages take. And the, this next level is, even if you have these mobile devices, the percentage of companies that move up, that have email usage is 55%. And if you have mobile devices and email usage, then you're likely, very likely to get to invoice electronic invoicing, which is 47%. But we, what we see here, we do, we do not observe in this in the survey, companies that do electronic invoicing that do not have email usage or do not use mobile devices. So in a way, it's like a path that companies must make, right? So if you wanna promote electronic invoicing, you must promote first mobile devices, email usage. So, and this, and this allows you to understand like the paths towards the technology that you want to promote. And also taking these numbers, the 69%, 55% and 47%, you can also understand how difficult it is or how easy it is to acquire a technology that you want to promote. You want, we call that the inclination, the inclination uh, coefficient, right? So you can tell how likely or how easy, how easy it is for, for for a company to get from from to going from zero to electronic invoicing, right? So this is this is an example. You know, this is a AI, and this is it's like a transformative technology. And when we see companies that use AI, we, we also see the same pattern. You know, you have to start with mobile devices. You gotta have them use email, and then you have to use you can use AI. Right, and this is this is this is a tougher technology to acquire because that jump from it's from email usage to chat GPT is only 14%. So that's like a big jump there in a way. And therefore this has a lot larger inclination. This technology has a larger inclination. And the other the other example that I brought is online government services. So online government services has another way of getting there. You have to have mobile devices, which is always like the first step. Bank, banking transactions, having a, a supplier's payment system, and then companies have these online government services. And these, these well, are- I wanna, these... Thank you so much for sharing those results. Um, I think this is really crucial to understand how to make democracy and the economy more accessible. 
it's not enough to simply do the research of where things are, but giving entrepreneurs um, a path uh, like a, a path to digital transformation is so crucial. And when I saw you share these results in Bogota in front of small business owners and entrepreneurs, I mean, you could just see them lighting up and understanding how to connect where they were on their digital journey to where they wanted to get to. Um, and I think this can be missed when we think about like how democracy delivers and it's really, you know, it's not just a one-sided process of government saying, okay, we want you to just use, you know, e-invoicing without understanding the larger journey that um, small businesses may need to be on to arrive to that point. Um, I want to thank you again so much for the excellent work uh, that you do at the Centro Nacional de Consultoria. And thank you for your time and sharing and encourage everyone to check out the results. Uh, we'll be sure to share them in the chat. And I will now turn it back to Tamari. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Luis. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you both so much. Um, as technology becomes ever more present in our daily lives, it's really interesting to see the implications for our entrepreneurs around the world. Last but certainly not least, it is my honor to introduce Soji Apampa. Soji is a champion in the field of anti-corruption. He co-founded the Convention on Business Integrity in 1997 and has since served as a senior advisor to the UN Global Compact on the 10th Principle Anti-Corruption and a consultant to the interagency task team of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, tasked with the responsibility of developing a national strategy to combat corruption. He is joining us today to speak about his strong successes in combating maritime corruption in Nigeria. Welcome, Soji. Thank you. Thanks, Tamari. Um, over the last five years, the number of demands of unreceded cash payments has fallen from 266 in 2019 to only 45 cases last year. First of all, I want to say congratulations on this amazing achievement. Thank you. Uh, can you describe what you did? Why is the Nigerian miracle, as it has been called, special? Okay. Um, hmm. The first thing is, it's very difficult to take um, individual credit um, as though just one person could make this happen because it was a joint effort between government, business, and civil society. But on our side, um, when I say our now, I mean the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, which partnered with the Convention on Business Integrity to, to get things moving in Nigeria. Um, what we did was that we tried to work with government to follow up on cases as reports were coming in from vessels of demands for, for corrupt payments. Um, but not um, unsurprisingly, the government refused to give us data and that anything that entered government's hands was now secret. So we couldn't actually follow up on cases. Then after reflecting carefully, and this is the part that we did, that we can claim to have done, we, we reflected on it and said, well, um, there are only a number of finite steps between when a vessel comes into Nigeria's waters, does its business and leaves. So why don't we model those steps, map them, and try to trap the data? And we were looking for how to trap the data all through those steps without changing behaviors too radically. Because if you require severe behavior change, then you won't get the data. But if it's a byproduct of what people already do, then you're very likely to get the kind of data. So the starting point was to get masters who are terrified of bringing ships to West Africa to actually telegraph their, their arrival and let us know so that we can monitor them. Um, <laughs> we were able to convince them because they already did this with their agents. They already um, sent out a pre-arrival notification to their ecosystem. 
So all we convinced their companies to do was to add an email line, add our email to that email. So then we were in a position to know the ETA, the IMO number of the vessel that is coming in, um, which port it's going to visit, and so on. And we also provided a helpline. So we called it the help desk. And masters, even from way out of Nigeria's waters, we find that they test those numbers. They even test them in the middle of the night to make sure that there is indeed a human being who would pick up the call in case they were in distress. So we then told them, if you, if you come up with any problems at any point in the process, we've mapped the process so we know which agency is responsible for what node. And we were able to get them to even um, quickly scan the gangway log. So we know who has signed in, from which agency, what is their name. So we're able to escalate. After a while, we were able to do this in real time. That as officials were beginning to make unwarranted demands, we were getting the escalations. We were escalating to partners in government who were getting the reports to the top of the correct agency. And they then had the ability to intervene live as it was happening to stop anything that was untoward. And now in a place like Nigeria, nobody uh, gets involved with crass corruption of just demanding money. They start with the finesse of trying to get you to agree that you have contravened some some requirements and then they say what are you going to do about it and now it's now you begging them to take money and <laughs> so it's it's that kind of approach so one of the things we also did was to encourage the publication of standard operating procedures so everyone knows what the rules are and everyone knows what the standard of compliance is However, there's still some areas in which it is not so easy to tell if you're compliant or you're not compliant. For instance, something as easy as a travel document. In our law, in, uh, in the, the, the immigration officials um, show us that in their law, it says it's the Comptroller General of Immigrations that decides from time to time what is an acceptable travel document. So an officer on board can say this is not acceptable and it can be acceptable today and not acceptable tomorrow. So it's those sorts of games that enable them to make those demands. That help desk was successful in being able to thwart those things by having um, professionals from within government then challenge the demands and challenge the so-called contraventions. And so we were able, because we were tracking all vessels coming in, whether they had problems or not, we were able to see the divergence after a while that the vessels are coming in, but a lot more of them are coming and going without incident. And that's how we were able to tell that things were improving. And it's not that the numbers of vessels were reducing, the numbers were increasing and the numbers that were using the help desk were increasing every day, but the numbers of complaints were going down and where there were complaints, they were being resolved. So um, the, the kinds of um, uh, punitive measures for complaining, which was a natural um, delay of a day or two or three days, and every day could cost you as much as $20,000 to $150,000 for not paying the demanded $5,000 or $20,000. So it's it's really important to put that in context. And that was the beginning of the miracle that where it cost on average $150,000 in on costs over and beyond what should be a normal cost, that has now dropped to an average of 20,000 per visit whereas it used to be 150,000 per visit. And the delays because of challenging government and pushing back on demands for bribes, 
they've gone. It used to take seven to nine days to run the gauntlet of the normal reporting system from the government. But this one happened within four to eight hours, all resolved without stopping the vessel from doing its normal business. Now, this was a miracle for the industry. And this help desk system of collecting the data, putting together the evidence, because even with immigrations, we were able to go to them and tell them there was a problem. And they pushed back and say, oh, who says there's a problem? You have no evidence. And we produced the evidence and we showed them we could even drill down to specific officers, specific days, specific times. And instead they thought, okay, okay, fine, fine. We will come up with some administrative order or explanation to the officers so they know how to do this with some consistency and so on. So we are using that data and evidence now in advocacy. That is what caught the attention of other countries. For example, uh, having a help desk now in Egypt and Ukraine had started its own help desk before the war. Un unfortunately, the war has, has really uh, put things upside down. But now the same thing is being done in India. Now they also have a help desk. And the entire project in Nigeria, which involved the government, business and civil society, this is now being emulated in Ghana. And Ghana said, well, if Nigeria can do it, we can do it. Why, how will Nigeria be better than us? And I'm glad, um, uh, I'm happy about that rivalry. It's not only over jollof rice that we have rivalry. Uh, we now have rivalry over trying to get something good going in the maritime sector. So really, that is the miracle uh, in a nutshell. And the bigger miracle is that our biggest champion in government has since retired, but the system hasn't dropped. It has continued. Um, a lot of the things that we were doing are now part of administrative processes within government. Uh, that is the bigger miracle, and we hope that we can keep this going um, into the future as well. Tamari? Right, thank you. Um, you answered so many questions of my questions. Oh. <laughs> um, what corruption efforts that have been in the past that maybe were not as successful what did you do differently this time okay differently this time is definitely data and evidence finding a way very simply to collect data in a way that data is a byproduct of people's normal activities rather than having to conduct a survey. In the old days, we would have conducted surveys. And so you can imagine the time lag. You can imagine that as soon as you publish it, it's out of date. But now we, we've, we've worked out a system and how to actually get it done, that it's happening as people are working and therefore interventions can be real time uh, and, and can be very meaningful, especially in things that mean life or death or that mean great loss to the private sector or, or great saving. So that is the big difference between what we did and what we used to do, Tamari. Thank you, Soji. Um, you mentioned that this model has spread to other countries, including India and Egypt. Do you know if they have already started to have similar success or what some of the outcomes of that have been? Yes, I know India definitely and Egypt definitely. And I know that before the war, even Ukraine recorded successes. They successfully challenged the government and in their case, they because the, the partner in, in Ukraine is a law firm, they actually took the government to court over uh, um, a few of the regulations and won the case. So uh, that having the data and evidence is really a shot in the arm for, for those who want to uh, push back on the issue of corruption. 
Would you say that a similar reporting system or helpline um, format could work in other fields? Or do you think this is something that is very limited to the maritime sector? I believe it can work in other fields, um, which is why we, we actually did a reflection and tried to see why it worked. And we were able to identify a number of components. Remember, I kept talking about a, a collaborator in government. So you really, it's not about just having a help desk. A help desk without having like an ombudsperson that not only is willing to take up the issues in real time as they're happening, but also has some teeth and, and is able to refer the errant people to an accountability mechanism. So um, we complained um, in 2019, that's before the numbers started coming down, we sent a report to the presidency that despite everything else that you've done and great collaboration, the numbers are not coming down. And we think it's not coming down because there are no consequences. They have refused to, to they've totally ignored what you've asked them to do. So they asked the Anti-Corruption Commission to come up with something and they designed some sting operations. And in the first month, they caught some 30 officials red-handed. So after that, the numbers began to drop year on year. And we continued to publish year on year the effects of what they were doing. So that's why I said it's very difficult for one party to just take the, the full credit for what has happened because it was all sides playing their role that made the change happen. But yes, it did start with the innovation um, in bringing in um, a, a help desk, which was the first real-time help desk uh, of its kind in the sector. Great, thank you. And then just one final question. What is kind of next for you? And what do you believe is some advice you could give or any anything that you would share for people trying to take on similar projects? Okay, so in terms of what's next um, uh, for, for, for us, we've already started working in Ghana. So that was the, the hint I threw. And we're hoping also to work in Senegal and maybe one other um, West African country um, over the next few years. We're also now working at other sectors. In Nigeria, we're looking now at the aviation sector. We're looking at the healthcare sector. We're looking at the electricity sector and trying to see if we can bring some of those lessons home to ordinary Nigerians and not, not just big international ship owners, can we really help um, ordinary Nigerians to get a better outcome from governance in Nigeria? So we're working in that. Um, in terms of general advice, I think that we should look carefully at collective action. I think where collective action works very well, um, the, the results can be pretty outstanding and the collaboration can go on for much longer than you can imagine. Because in Nigeria, it has spanned regime change about four or five times. That each time a new regime comes, we are the ones who have to go and enlighten them about what's been happening and encourage them to take credit for it and show them how they can take full credit for it and, and what is the new thing they could add for them to totally own the change. And that has been a very successful way of, of getting it to, to keep going from regime to regime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soji, so much for taking the time. It's been really inspiring to hear about your success. And thank you to all of our wonderful speakers from sharing your stories. It's been so inspiring to hear how you've been able to make such um, concrete changes in your own region and even beyond. Um, again, as I said in the beginning, this is only a tiny sliver of the amazing work that our members are doing around the world every day. 
Um, and it's always so inspiring to be able to see the great work that you all do. Um, so for our audience, we're now going on a short 30 minute break. I encourage you to go and explore the expo where you can pop into a meeting room to meet and network with your fellow attendees or just stop by and say hi and introduce yourself in the chat. And we'll see you shortly for our final panel, Future Forward, um, where we discuss how we move forward and seize opportunities to continue to build better democracies. Thank you. <laughs>